while it's, well, I have no signal, so maybe it'll warm up. Um, while it is preparing, and if, if all else fails, I have the Bible. It, isn't that kind of neat? <laughs> okay, the Hebrew lesson is from Amos 7, verses 7 through 9. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Israel shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. And having no signal there, I'll take the signal from the good book. Our epistle reading is Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 21. And pastor will be reading John later on. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, so then it is no longer that I do it, but sin which dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what it is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. I find that passage very timely in the happenings of our world right now. The word of God for the people of God. I invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel message. And if you cannot hear me, please let me know because the volume can be turned up. We are looking in the gospel of John, chapter 8, 1 through 11. They each went to their own homes, and Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he returned to the temple, and all the people gathered around him, and he sat down and taught them. The legal experts and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. Placing her in the center of the group, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone women like this. What do you say? They said this to test him, because they wanted a reason to bring an accusation against him. Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground with his finger, they continued to question him, so he stood up and replied, Whoever hasn't sinned should throw the first stone. Bending down again, he wrote on the ground. Those who heard him went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. Finally, only Jesus was with the woman, and they were left in the middle of the crowd. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Is there no one to condemn you? She said, No one, sir. Jesus replied, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, don't sin anymore. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This is the third week in our series about God. We began with God loves you. And then last week we looked at God understands you. And today we're looking at the fact that God forgives you. Do you believe those words? Does God forgive? Exactly what is it that God forgives? Have you ever thought about that? We just heard a passage from the book of Amos. I don't know about you, but when I look at some of these Old Testament prophets... I wonder what kind of a person they really were. I mean, if God picked them out of all of the hundreds and thousands of people 
to be a spokesperson for him, there must have been some kind of quality about them. Amos is best described as a man of God. He was a man whose life was spent serving God, and, and his life saw reflected that. Yet he was no high priest, just a person who tended to his sheep, the lowest job anybody could have, and he also had a grove of sycamore fig trees. He was a contented man, happy to go on about his every day, doing his everyday thing, minding his own business. When God tapped him on the shoulder and, and he says, Amos, I got a job for you. I need you to go set the people of Israel straight. We don't know whether Amos questioned what God had him do. We don't know what kind of education he had, but the message that God had given him was something like, let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never-failing stream. In the book of Amos, it was written about 750 years before Jesus came on the scene. Caused the Israelites to do three things. It made them look back at what they had become. It made them realize how far away from God they had strayed. And it moved them to come back to God. That same situation is what takes place in our world today. In our reading, we find that Amos was having a vision. The vision was in three parts. The vision said it foretold destruction of Israel. Now, I want you to picture if you were sitting here and I was Amos and I'm proclaiming to you, when you walk out the front door today, there are going to be so many locusts on the ground, you are not going to be able to see where you're going. And they're going to attack you and they're going to devour you. Would you walk outside this building? Or would you wait and listen? You know, locusts can make a really loud noise when they gather together. That was the first destruction that God said he was going to bring on the people of Israel. And then the second one, okay, we already talked about a fire in our God sightings. If I were to tell you that when you walk outside, the whole world was going to be set ablaze, and you can't stay in here. You have to go out and walk right into it. Would you do it? Yep. yep. <laughs> Probably not. Well, Amos prayed to God. He said, God, don't send the locusts. God, don't send the fire. And God heard Amos' prayer, and he didn't do either one of those things. But he could have. However, when it came to the third one, God said, you need to make the people toe the line. Now, I had thought about this morning getting a piece of rope and tying it across the entryway there on the altar and making that a plumb line. How many of you know what a plumb line is? Anybody that's done any kind of construction knows that a plumb line is set in place so that when a wall goes up, the wall goes up straight. And if that plumb line gets out of kilter with that wall going up, guess what it's going to do? It's going to make your wall go this way and that way. And, you know, kind of like a friend of mine who was really, really proud. She had done some DIY work herself, put wall paneling in her basement. And so I was taking a look at that wall paneling in her basement. And I noticed that the wall paneling in her basement kind of did one of these numbers. And there was this big bubble and I didn't say anything to her about it because I didn't want to upset her because she was so proud of the job that she had done. But then about a week or two later, I got a call from her, and she said, you remember that paneling that I put up in my basement? I said, yeah. Well, one section of it was curved, and it all fell down. And I thought, gee, I wonder why. It wasn't my fault. I didn't touch it. On the first two parts of this vision, as I said, God forgave the people. But then he took out that plumb line. And he told Amos, 
I'm going to hold my people accountable for the love and the mercy that I would like to honor them with. If you are to build any kind of a structure and have it stand firm, you need a good foundation. And you need walls that are going to raise up straight and tall and stay in line. If the wall is leaning or is in a fixed base, it's always moving. It's not going to last very long. It'll become weak and soon it'll fall down. Some people are good at DIY projects. My friend is not. I am not. I told my husband there are things that I would like to have done at our house in Belleville, and I worked on some of it when I was there this weekend. I can handle a paintbrush. Not a problem. The problem I have is getting the can of paint open and stirring it up till I can paint. There wasn't anybody to help me open that can. So I didn't paint. I just looked at the wall, and I thought, Bill's going there next week. I can leave it on the list of things for him to do. You see, he didn't go with me. He stayed here to take care of the dogs and the cats. And so I had a two-day journey on my own. And, and when I left, I left him a list of things for here in Goodland. Um, I bought a new grass trimmer edger for the parsonage. I left this cute little note. Honey, put it together so we can use it. Honey, there's dishes in the kitchen sink. Honey, the outside lights on the parsonage don't work. All three bulbs are burned out, and I can't figure out how to get the lantern off. Well, two of the three got done by the time I got back last night. He said, you're going to help me with those lights. I can't get them. What about us? When it comes to a plumb line as the church, if God were to drop a plumb line within these walls, Aligning us, would God be pleased with the results? Or would he be afraid of what he saw? The scripture says, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The religious leaders wanted to trap Jesus in order to have a basis for accusing him of something because they couldn't find any fault with him. He quickly turned the tables on them, and I really like this story in the Gospel of John. Jesus was slow to respond. He listened intently to their accusations concerning the woman. I wonder why the man wasn't brought into question. Only a woman would think of that question. And I wonder also whether or not they had set her up whether they introduced her to this man, hoping that she would do whatever she was going to do with him, so that at that very impact moment, they could grab her and bring her and stand her before Jesus and say, look, she was messing up. She committed adultery. Hmm. But what about Jesus' response? Have you ever wondered when you read this passage what it was he was writing in the sand? You know, I'd like to think he was drawing flowers or a puppy dog or a house or... No, not really. There are scholars out there that believe he was writing all of the sins that those were accusing him of committing, those things that they had committed. Or maybe he was writing the law of Moses in the sand. Thou shalt not bear false witness against another. We really don't know what Jesus wrote in the sand on that day. But bottom line is, none of them could pick up a stone and throw it at her. Jesus was left standing all alone with that woman. The love and the compassion that he showed her. She knew what her lifestyle was all about. But God forgives. His goal was to rebuke the hypocrisy and call the people to self-examination before judging others. As they would reflect on their own sin, their desire to punish somebody would go away. These are good words for us today. 
Are you listening? When have you condemned someone's actions without knowing the whole truth? We're all guilty of it. This church is in a time of transition, as are many mainline denominations throughout the world. Ours isn't the only one in decline in attendance, in tithing, in giving of our time and our talent and our service. It's a nationwide epidemic because we have allowed life to take first place in our hearts and we've put God on the back burner. I know the things I ought to do and the things I want to do aren't always what I do because I always end up doing the wrong thing. That was Paul speaking. When we took our vows of membership with these vows came a relationship and a responsibility to be the best United Methodist member that we could be. That includes volunteering to be active in the life of the church. Some United Methodist churches have classes. When people come and say, I want to be a member, they have to attend a six or an eight week class. And in that class, they are given opportunities to declare their gifts and graces. They are given an opportunity to choose what area of ministry in the life of that church they would like to be a part of. And if the person's response says, well, I don't fit into any of these categories, then the teacher of that class will say, well, then, perhaps this isn't the church for you. Expectation. We have lost our expectation for our members of our church. We don't give people ways to use their gifts and graces in a way that would complement what God's already got inside of them. We simply assign, you do this and you do this and you do this. But it makes more sense if we say, you know, I noticed you out there tinkering in your garden. How would you like to be responsible for flowers on the altar? Anita Coleman does a wonderful job of that. You know, Curtis Duncan is going to be going to the hospital tomorrow. Dick Short, a volunteer, to drive him there to Hayes. And he's got a ride coming back. But you heard him say, for the next four weeks, he's not going to be allowed to drive anywhere. Now, he still has to earn a living. He still has to recover. He's still going to need groceries. I think it would be wonderful, without signing up anywhere, if people just called Curtis and said, hey... Can I give you a ride to work today? Can I take you out for lunch? Can I, what do you like to eat? I think Curtis will eat anything. I like to eat anything. He wants to be heart healthy. And we can help him be heart healthy. Your church family is looking for an organizer for the ice cream making next Sunday afternoon. Sign-up sheets are already in place. Half the work is done. Please take time and look at that and see what you can do. And if you are able to bring or volunteer any of the ingredients, the fellowship hall will be open Monday through Friday this coming week, um, pretty much all day long from like 8 to 4. And just drop your stuff over. If it needs to go in the refrigerator, put it in the refrigerator. The door on the parking lot side will be the door that will be open. Scott's not here today. He won't be here tomorrow. His mom's having some tests in Denver, and so keep them in prayer as they travel. He was also going to take in a Newsboys concert tonight. I'm really jealous. We also need someone to transport ice. We have a volunteer from the Elks Club who says we can have all the ice we want for free, but we got to come and get it. So we need ice chests. We need volunteers to go and pick the ice up and bring it to the church. We don't have Wayne Aiton here this year with all those milk jugs frozen in his freezer. We're going to have to do it ourselves. We're going to have to be the church. What a concept. <laughs> be the church. Volunteers are needed to usher our children from one place activity to another for vacation Bible school. Who among you can read music and are gifted in leading others to follow music? 
and sing to the glory of God. Do you play drums, guitars? How about a keyboard? Has God gifted you with a voice that you can use in the life of the church outside the bucket? Reaching families, young and old, is difficult. And it's getting harder and harder because we have allowed the activities of our everyday life to take over. We aren't walking that plumb line and building a straight wall. There's a wall being built, but not the kind that we can break through. Beginning on July 24th, an alternative Sunday morning worship service will be started at 8.30 on a Sunday morning in the Fellowship Hall. We have had lots of comments of how much people enjoyed the last two weeks over in Fellowship Hall. And I'd like to continue that. And so we're going to have a praise service. It will not have a church bulletin, so if you have to have a bulletin, you can come in here and pick one up and bring it over, but know that it's probably not going to be followed. It's going to be music. It's going to be standing up and witnessing what Christ has done in your life during the week. It's going to be the message that is presented in the 1030 service, and it's going to be more music, and it's going to be just praying and asking God to intercede in the life of the church. If we are going to grow, if we are going to evolve, if we are going to build our church, we have to change. 1030 service will be the traditional 1030 service. It's still going to be here. It always will be here. But I want you to think about trying something new. Now, that doesn't mean if you come to the 830 service that you can't also come to the 1030 or you can choose which one you want to come to. Maybe one Sunday you have a family activity going on in the afternoon and you need to come to church early. Give the 8.30 service a try. It won't be for everybody. But it'll be for those people that God chooses to bring. Are you game for something new? Hurts and unforgiven events of the past have caused a stunt in the growth of this church. Healing comes when we reach out like Paul. He admitted that he wants to do the right thing, but doesn't always do the right thing. And we don't know if this is the right thing to do, but if we don't try it, we, it's going to fail. We all make mistakes, and God forgives us. Remember that. God forgives. We don't forgive one another. Well... You can ask of someone's forgiveness. But if someone has wronged you in the life of the church and they don't know about it, guess what? You're the one holding on to that guilt. Because that person doesn't know that they've done something that bothers you. And when you ask forgiveness of someone, they may or may not choose to accept that forgiveness. But the fact that you have asked clears your conscience. And hold you accountable to God that you have done everything in your power to mend the fence. Finally, Paul wrote in Romans, But in fact, it is no longer that I do, that I do it, but what? Christ that dwells in me. The devil doesn't make us do anything. We may like to think so and we may like to blame him. But we have a choice to follow Jesus or to allow Satan to tear this church apart. I choose to follow Jesus. I choose to grow the church. How will you be willing to accept forgiveness and be forgiving towards others as God has forgiven you? Amen. I invite you to stand our closing hymn. Lord, I want to be a Christian. You'll find it in the hymn book on 402.